Thank you and welcome everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to have a, a guest speaker today, Professor Kevin Gardner. He will be talking about transforming nature switches into our tech tools and therapeutics. Professor Kevin Gardner is the director of the Structural Biology Initiative at the City University of New York and uh, the Einstein Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry, City College of New York. Uh, Professor Kevin Gardner received his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from UC Davis uh, before obtaining his PhD in Molecular Biophysics and Biochemistry from Yale University. He did a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Dr. Luis K in the University of Toronto, and which is the methods, uh, develops some methods which are used very frequently for any practitioners of any spectroscopy of proteins. So uh, we read his papers with great interest. So when uh, he started his career as a setting by setting up the structural biology research group within the Department of Physics and Biochemistry at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, uh, he serves as an director of the structural biology initiative of the City University of New York Advanced Science Research Center. And as Einstein Professor of Chemistry and Biochemistry of City College at the Advanced Science Research Center, the multidisciplinary research enterprise that is built by uh, City University of New York, There's, there are teams of scientists in fields often separated within most academic centers, for example, structure and biology, photonics, nanotechnology, neuroscience, and environmental sciences, to catalyze novel collaborative interactions among experts in these fields. Um, Professor Gardner, it's a pleasure to have you here. All right, thank you very much for the generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for taking time out on um, this afternoon to hear a little bit about the work that we've done in New York and in Dallas. Um, I wanna start by thanking the team of people who are responsible for the work. Some of the stories you're going to hear today are brand new. Some are ones that have been going on as long as the lab has been open, which is almost 20 years or almost 25 years now. This is the current line of the group in uh, New York as of this summer, and I'll be sure to call out people individually as we get to them. And we're also very thankful for funding from both government and non-governmental organizations to support the work. First, a little bit of introduction. As with you, I work at a brand new research center. In this case, one that has been open since 2014. So part of why I want to come and share a word of this today is uh, to hear a little bit about people also new a new organization, about the things that we all see in common as our strengths and our challenges as we go forward trying to set these up. Within uh, New York, here's a little bit of introduction as where we are. We're looking at a city block uh, in the northern part of Manhattan in the center of New York. Um, we are in a neighborhood called Harlem. And here on one block, three institutions have chosen to put research buildings right next to each other, uh, building a lot of synergy between all of us. So most critically, we've got the CUNY Advanced Science Research Center over here. CUNY is the City University of New York system. We are one of two public university systems funded, in this case, by the state and city of New York. And uh, the oldest of our campuses, City College of New York, uh, it has provided the space while this occurs. City College of New York has just turned 175 years old as the flagship of the CUNY system. Um, the ASRC is not 175 years old, we are even 10 years old. And as introduced, it was envisioned as a place where researchers who normally be in very different departments, like saying we have our five initiatives that are interdisciplinary, uh, structural biology, environmental science, neuroscience, photonics, and nanoscience, in many universities, our faculty would be spread in five buildings, reporting to four chairs, to three deans, and probably two provosts. And we'd never know each other or work together with each other. But the concept here was to set us off all inside of one building to get us to interact with each other a little more aggressively, and also set up core facilities, not just for our use, but for academic and industrial labs from throughout the region to be able to take advantage of this, helping industrial and academic researchers and education go on some of this. Next to us, the City College of New York has put a new research building up of its own. And next to that is a small building over here as part of the New York Structural Biology Consortium, NYSBC. 
roughly 25 years ago, nine of the New York institutions recognized that advances in our field, structural boundary were becoming too expensive for any one organization to go buy the infrastructure required to be able to go do this. Or especially in a crowded city like New York, find enough space for it where we didn't have a metro running nearby or a big street. We needed space where this work could occur. And that site here was chosen to be, um, be the one for it. Put this in perspective, that's about 40 meters here, and that's about 60 meters there. So all within one tight area, we've got research across structural biology, uniting the themes in each of these buildings. As a result, it's built between the three organizations coming together. What is truly, in my opinion, an international level degree of support and expertise for our work. Um, in aggregate amongst the institutions here, structural biology is built on three primary methods for high resolution structure determination, NMR spectroscopy, electron microscopy, and X-ray diffraction. And as a result of this, these organizations put together, and I should note CUNY is one of the institutions here at NYSBC. We now have 12 NMR spectrometers in amongst these buildings from 500 to 900 megahertz, giving us state-of-the-art access there. Uh, 14 and an increasing number of electron microscopes organized for single particle IEM or electron tomography, currently 14 of those, including two national centers from the National Institutes of Health. And then 90 minutes away is a brand new synchrotron uh, at the Brookhaven National Lab run by the Department of Energy. One beam line there called NYX is solely intended for use by members of the NYSBC consortium. So truly for me as a structural biologist, it's a privilege to work in an environment like this, providing access to the kinds of expertise and technologies, not just to very advanced students, but even to the undergrads and PhD students and groups who are getting very direct hands-on learning and taking their own research in areas that I think would be challenging to pursue in many other parts of the world, including the United States. So that's the whole, and one last thing, most importantly to me, the critical part of a good organization are good people. And so with that, I've been able to be very lucky to be the director of a structural biology floor here, go recruit three new professors who are doing both teaching and research. I want to be clear in the US model, these individuals work on research programs very different than what I do. My goal is really to be almost in the role of a coach or a mentor, helping them succeed as individuals with their own research plans and ideas. So someone with expertise in cloud electron microscopy, in liquid-liquid phase separation, and in room temperature x-ray diffraction. And they're joined by four additional individuals who provide specialized expertise into some of those advanced technologies. So students from Lawrence who have never done any kind of minimal actually crystallography of EM um, can go access high-end mass spectrometry, MR spectroscopy, or X-ray diffraction with an outstanding team of people here, or work with an expert in the field of um, data science who specializes in developing novel ways to use the terabytes worth of data that we get out of these data sets and put them to good use. This is uh, built out of a team, uh, and then again, the people in our labs are uh, typically undergrads and PhD students and postdocs from within the CUNY system, but we also host a range of national and international visitors from students up to faculty in various places. It's been a very dynamic environment to be part of, believe me. So that's a little bit of who we are and a little bit of where we are. Let's talk now about what we do. So my group, I think like many people in the biological sciences has a pretty simple question. How do organisms and cells know what's going on in the world around them? How do they understand if there's too much of a pollutant, too little of a nutrient, some other kind of signal, biochemical or physical signal coming in from the area around them? How do they sense that? How do they make a decision? What is too much? What is too little? And then how do they act on it? Biology, those are handled by receptors, by protein-based machines that do the sensing, decision-making, and, and uh, executing of all those. And we're interested in how those work. Now, unlike many of my colleagues who study only these signaling pathways in one kind of organism or in response to one stimulus, we believe that there's a lot of strength by comparison. When I mean comparison, we look broadly in biology. I'm understanding how these plants are looking here in a 24 hour time lapse movie of where the blue light and only the blue light coming out of this white light is coming from, so that it can grow towards it. Either as a point light source or go straight up. 
how do these cells out of a human kidney you know, if they have enough oxygen or not? And if not, turn on certain genes in response to that. And then uh, how do these fish that live here along my part of the United States going up into Canada? They have a sensor, as we all do in our bodies, for xenobiotics, for foreign compounds that your body has never seen before. Oftentimes, regrettably, pollutants or byproducts of industrial processes. It turns out that for these fish that live here to the north, which has been relatively under-industrialized, they have a very sensitive version of the sensor. But the ones who live down here, closer to New York City, located here on this map, but then there's been over 300 years of industrialization. Already those fish have had to evolve a dumber, less sensitive version of that switch because it would otherwise have been overwhelmed by uh, the products of New York City and the area around it, producing environmental pollution for many years. So what in common, you've got to be asking yourself, what do these plants and the human kidney cells and these fish, what do they have in common amongst all those signaling systems? It turns out, in order to look, you can't look at the organism, obviously, you've got to look at the molecules. And what we see here is that there are classes of molecules where nature has evolved a good way to sense environmental stimuli, and they use it again and again and again. Arguably, the most famous of these in human systems are the G protein coupled receptors, the GPCRs. These are integral membrane receptors. This is what's targeted by over half of the drugs that are only being produced by the pharmaceutical business. And they are exquisite ways, especially in vertebrate systems, especially in mammalian systems, to control biology, supplying chiefly small molecules to turn these on and off. Everyone in this room are using many of these right now, including the rhodopsin in your eyes that you're using to look at me, or look at the screen, look at a computer, whatever you're looking at. You can thank a GPCR called rhodopsin for doing that and a small molecule inside of it called red now that is doing photochemistry in response to the photons out of the lights above us for off the screen. Here we've looked at another family that is even more widely distributed, coming from the bacteria to us. And what's common about them are these relatively small modules, about 110, 120 amino acids in size, and pastelines, Currently found in, uh, I made this, this slide updated the statistic here about two or three months ago, 30,000 proteins. And what's common amongst them, I hope for those of you who are not experts in structural biology, you can see they kind of look a bit alike. There's uh, a series of arrows here in the back representing a five stranded area parallel beta sheet, a series of coils in the top representing an alpha helical layer. And where the magic starts happening is the ability of them to bind different small molecules inside of them to respond to different stimuli. Here, for example, is a um, part of an oxygen sensor out of soil bacteria that are used to fix nitrogen out of the air to provide um, fertilizer, produce nitrogen equivalents for a growing plant. Those systems are exquisitely sensitive to oxygen, so they build a sensor around heme. The same thing in all of our bodies right now that are being used to carry oxygen and hemoglobin or stored in myoglobin in your cells. Here's uh, something out of a, a strange bacteria from the Egyptian desert, it's uh, sensitive to blue light and it has a molecule that can undergo changes with photochemistry to tell a bacteria where to go or not. But what's really cool from our perspective are cases like this one at the end where there's no small molecule bounds. And maybe there are space, maybe there are hints from our looking at structure that can give us insights that maybe something could bind it. We've just been unlucky. We've not been very good in the lab and we've missed it. And that inspires us to go look at what those signals are. So that's what we do. Think of us as being interested. I love biology. I love it from all over the place. But what is really the root of the thing that ties us all together are then the molecules underneath of that and how a sensor has been evolved again and again and again to sense all kinds of different stimuli. Because that challenges us as structural biologists, where we're used to thinking about one structure as one function. Here we have one structure, apparently many functions. So uh, in today's talk, I want to focus on two developed stories, one over in blue light sensing out of plants and bacteria. We'll talk a little bit about how that happens and how we can adapt some of the switches there for use in biotechnology. Then I want to transition to a topic that's much more biomedically relevant, 
option sensing and signaling inside of us, and in particular, as it can go out of control in various cancers. Now, we might be able to use some of the lessons learned from structural biology and learned from the blue light story up here to find ways to develop novel pharmaceutical compounds to control that process at times of our choosing. And I want to give a little bit of a hint as to directions as to where we need to go in the future. So let's start with the first topic, blue light photosensing. Here we're going to focus on how some of these past domains have been repeatedly used to sense blue light in plants and bacteria. Uh, not in us, I need to be very clear about that, but in almost every other part of biology aside from the human animals. So in this case, what we can see is that there's a conserved version of that sensor you just saw on the last slide. It binds a blue light sensitive small molecule called riboflavin, or versions of it, flavin mononucleotide or flavin adenine dinucleotide. And what we can see from bioinformatics is that it occurs in thousands of proteins where the photosensory module is conserved, but then different other pieces of proteins are attached on to the same protein. So for example, these can be catalytic domains like kinases, non-catalytic domains like DNA binding proteins, other machines that we aren't entirely sure what they are yet. How can nature use the same machine here to sense blue light, but then control different outputs. That's what we're interested in. And again, I love photobiology as a particular area of biology. I grew up as the son of a laser engineer. So we had photons flying around all over the house in different ways. I've loved most importantly, understanding how they get used by biology to control all kinds of responses, whether a one-time response or things like the 24 hour circadian cycle that we all have. So here, the blue light photochemistry that occurs not only in the land plants, but to synchronize the circadian rhythms of molds and fungi, like this bread mold here. It also functions quite nicely in uh, bacteria in the ocean, where blue light tells you not only what time of day it is, but whether you're swimming at the top of the ocean or deep in the ocean. And then important to make decisions on like whether you're going to get your energy from photosynthesis or some other. So our work started initially with looking a uh, sensor out of plants, class of enzymes known as phototropins for the process that control phototropism, the ability of plants to grow towards a light source. And what we could see there was a conventional kinase domain, but the internal side of it was one of these class domains with a single molecule of flavin inside. Colleagues of ours who used other kinds of spectroscopy could show what was happening in the flavin itself. Notably, it would bind non covalently to the protein in the dark. Blue light photochemistry takes it around doing some really elegant photochemistry here, resulting in a formation of a new covalent bond between part of the protein, cystineal sulfur, and the C4A position of the flavin here. Uh, meanwhile, you go from an oxidized flavin to a reduced flavin. So the changes structurally here are pretty subtle. Uh, addition of one bond, Reduction here, protonation at this N5 position. And folks, that photochemistry, subtle change, is sufficient for every plant I've seen in the drives through India and everywhere else in the world to know what time of day it is. And that has tremendous practical implications on crop density, yield, production. So if we don't understand this, we're lucky we got here. <laughs> but people are looking to engineer this as a way to develop better ways to. Uh, produce crops, for example, in a wide variety of ways. Um, notably, um, what I'm interested in though is how these changes perturb the protein around it, like this. Ah, one other thing I should note, uh, when the sun sets, when the night comes and the sun goes down, all those versions that you saw here in this photoactivated state return back to the original ground state, returned ready for the sun to rise the next day. I should note this controls the serine framing process to me. Kindness is off here in the dark, on in the light. So to study this, we used uh, techniques such as we're both familiar with, with uh, solution NMR spectroscopy, where I could go through and not just run spectra of these in the dark using all kinds of sophisticated methods, but by using lasers and fiber optics, we could record them in the light. We could remote, we could record movies of the protein interconverting between the dark and the light state over and over again. And we could identify aspects that have that structural change work. And critically, what that showed is that an alpha helix shown here at the back hooks only onto the rest of the protein in the dark. So our question, how does this sense blue light 
And we know the photochemistry here, thanks to the other spectroscopists. The next step is a part of the protein is attached in the dark and released in the light. Already that's turned into a wide variety of research reagents and biotech tools. For example, people have gotten very clever in hiding other protein sequences in that helix in the back. For example, a signal that might tell the cell to export the protein out of the nucleus, a nuclear export signal. If you do that and attach this genetically onto a protein of interest, you can have it export out of the nucleus simply by shining a little blue light. It's all the 140 amino acids with a common chromophore. Okay, that's kind of cool. But I want to know, not just does this work over in the land plants, but how about in the literally thousands of other proteins where it can be found? For example, over in this fungi with the day-night cycle I was talking about, are these marine bacteria? In order to answer to that, we teamed up to the lab of Brian Shaw at the University of Pennsylvania. Brian got us access to a very nice data set coming out of a Chinese very large scale high throughput sequencing project of, um, with a target of sequencing a thousand new eukaryotic genomes from plants and fungi. That project was successful. They're now in the middle of a 10,000 genome project. And so what we had was a stream of putative protein sequences from all over the world and all kinds of organisms. And we could ask using computational methods where were those photosensory domains shown here in white circles? And how then could they be hooked up with other kinds of effectors, not just that helix and the kinase like I told you about before, but now different kinds of DNA binding proteins, RNA binding proteins, parts of the circadian clock. And I could go on and on and on. So now I want to know, nature's been running this experiment for millions of years. Is any of this idea of Use the photochemistry to control a helix being attached or released going on in any of these systems or not? We have 8,000 chances to find out. Let's go do that. So work here done by a very talented uh, MD, PhD student in my lab, Abby Nash, assisted by a postdoc in the lab at the time, Brian Zatowski, went through and started looking at the structures of one of these from one of the marine bacteria I was telling you about before. In this case, the protein is really small. It's just a raw photosensory domain here and an alpha helical DNA binding domain called a helix turn helix DNA binding domain, commonly used in bacteria. Um, the helix that we had from before, the one that comes right after the photosensor, by the way, is often a region where we don't think it's doing anything interesting. It's not involved in the photochemical process like you saw from before. Hmm. That's interesting. How could that work? So to answer that, Abby used solution in a more good solution structure is this. I'm showing you here actually a crystal structure from a collaborator at Luki, who is then at UC Irvine. And as soon as we saw the structure, aha, this is how this works. There's actually a different helix that is bound up against the beta sheet surface at the same location from before. So we think it's this helix now that is bound in the dark, at least in the light. So what? Well, so what? These DNA binding domains only bind DNA as dimers. This protein is a monomer in the dark, as in this crystal structure and our NMR data. Guess where the dimerization surface is? More on that in a minute. But we thought that this would go from being inactive at binding in the dark, can't bind DNA, to being able to bind DNA in the light. We want more information on that. So I should note that there have been challenges in using those big three structures for high resolution structure determination I told you about before to get red state structures of some of these photoreceptors because they are typically more dynamic than their dark state colleagues. It complicates X-ray crystallography, which requires something crystallized. It typically works better when your protein is not dynamic. NMR is great at looking at dynamic things in solution, but at certain time scales, we lose signals due to something known as intermediate time scale exchange problem. And final electron microscopy has been challenged to look at these because they're relatively small. So we need other methods. We need two things, actually. Number one, we need other methods. In this case, EPR spectroscopy, HDX, MS, hydrogen deuterium exchange by mass spec, all kinds of other methods that while not giving us a high resolution structure on their own, give us information that reminds me of the old adage of the blind man meeting the elephant. He can go up and understand what's immediately in front of him, but with enough blind men looking at different parts of the elephant and talking to each other, 
we can build a structure what this looks like in the lead state. So that's one thing we need, which are these other methods that can work where the traditional methods cannot. We need something else, which is a fantastic student to go pursue this work. So in this case, the fantastic student is Indian. Uthana Edu Bukani, who did her undergrad and master's work in Afghanistan, before moving to New York, working as a research technician for some period of time and joining my group. So what she wanted to do was to go from this dark state structure that we have in high resolution X-ray and MMR methods and transitioning that over into understanding what it would look like in the lit state bound to DNA. And she did exactly what I just told you. Use a bunch of methods that work in solution to get information on these systems and add the information up. None of these give a high resolution structure like X-ray crystallography, NMR, or IOEM, but instead add those together. For example, to use hydrogen deuterium exchange to look at what parts of the protein are more or, or less accessible to solvent going from dark to light. We use EPR spectroscopy, a cousin of NMR, now using unpaired electron spins. And we can measure distances between those at the tens of angstrom scale, far longer than we can get by NMR. Use those distances to be able to show how these two domains might move with respect to each other. Put those together into a computational workflow, develop models of the lead state. And what we could see through Uthama's critical work here is we go from a dark state monomer, unable to bind DNA, over to a lit state dimer that does bind DNA nicely, using dimerization not only between the log domains on a surface that was hidden in the dark, but also now between those four alpha helices that were occluded in the dark state structure. So what does that do? In the native organism, which is a very strange and somewhat not so interesting bacteria that grows in the Atlantic Ocean, it turns on genes to be able to help that organism harvest light. What else can we do with it? Let's turn it into something that will turn genes on and off in more interesting systems, like say a cancer cell growing in a tumor on the side of a mouse. So to do that, um, built a fantastic team, really spearheaded by these three people, Laura Modomena, a postdoc and then a research associate in the group, Elizabeth Worth, who was in the lab as a research technician before going to get her own PhD, and not clear who's a current PhD student in the group. And here we could take EL222, which evolved again in bacteria, and show it how to work in a eukaryotic cell by, for example, a nuclear localization sequence. Bacteria don't have nuclei. It's never had to understand what a nucleus is. We've taught it what that is now and how to enter. And then how to interface with the eukaryotic transcriptional machinery to turn on eukaryotic genes. And then using a high affinity DNA binding site that Laura engineered upstream of a minimal reporter, we could go on and turn any kind of genes we want on cells in culture or on cells in living organisms, simply by shining a little blue light on them at times of our choosing. This has been fantastic. It's now a uh, last count in over 80 labs. Our technology companies love this. For example, I'm showing data here where a biotech company was expressing a target under control of this in yeast. And they wanted very precise control, only express the gene at times they want at a level they choose. We can do that. You want to turn on a gene more? simply shine the light spreader or more regularly and the cells will respond. The developmental biologists are eating this up. Um, absolutely loving this. This is really work I want to highlight by Stephanie Wu and her team at UC Merced. What you're looking at here is a developing zebrafish embryo where our developmental biologists want to understand if they eliminate these precursor cells to express a long-lived reporter, fluorescent protein, for example. Eliminate here, come in three days later, you can see that these precursor cells, which are all together in one part of the organism are on, have now differentiated and moved throughout. You can also run perturbative experiments. For example, not turning on a reporter here, but turn on a potent cell toxin. So you can ablate or kill subsets of cells in a developing here fish embryo and look at the impact of that in ways that are never accessible using the conventional genetic and chemical tools today. So where does this leave us? We've got two examples I've shown you here. There are many more examples in my lab that I will omit for the purposes of time. But suffice it to say, we've seen plenty of examples where in a dark state, we have a non-covalently bound flavor. In a light state, you covalently attach it. That causes structural changes, releasing all free interactions that the heel call peace elsewhere. We've seen this again and again and again. Shown again here the phototropin data from plants, 
in Fama's elegant data from EL222, the DNA binder, but there are many other examples as well. This effector release model then gives us mechanism-based understanding of natural systems and helps guide and inspire people to go into protein design, to go make novel tools of their own choosing, to be able to turn on ideas and systems we've never even thought about yet. So that's part one. Let's transition over to part two, which is the more biomedically relevant case. In this case, I want to focus on not light sensing, but oxygen sensing. And I want to focus regrettably on a, a, a dear topic to many of us who've uh, lost uh, friends and family to cancers. I want to understand how an oxygen sensing goes awry. Cancer will soon follow. Again, past domains are involved. And again, it'll be, they'll be involved by having small molecules coming in and out of them, in this case, not being turned on and off by uh, blue light. A little bit of background here, two slide introduction to the biology of the system. These involve the hypoxia-inducible factors of the HIS. Um, work in this field has been going on for a little over 25 years, recognized in 2019 with the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to Bill Kalin, Peter Radcliffe, and Greg Semenza for almost everything I'm going to show on the next slide. How do you turn a set of genes on and off in our cells due to oxygen? The way that nature has chosen to solve this problem is the transcriptional response. Build this transcription factor called HIF, hypoxia-inducible factor, only when oxygen levels are low. Hypoxia-inducible factor, so it's turned on in low oxygen under hypoxia. It's built out of two proteins, one protein called ART or HIF-beta by some people, with all due respect, it is pretty boring, it is always present in the nucleus as a partner. Where the interesting biochemistry is happening is with the HIF alpha part. One of these three, HIF one alpha, two alpha, or three alpha, they're all highly related in us. They're expressed in different tissues and different cancers depend on them somewhat differently, but they're all controlled the same way. They're always being made and what oxygen controls is whether enough of them builds up to build the HIF complex or not. What the Nobel Prize went for is showing all the business in this way step. There are oxygen dependent enzymes that use the O2 that needs to be sensed to make a post-translational modification, actually a couple of post-translational modifications to the HIFs. When oxygen levels are high, you put a hydroxyl group on one of two prolines or both prolines here in part of this, uh, this part of the HIF alpha called oxygen dependent degradation domain. I also put a hydroxyl group somewhere here later, but I'm not going to get into that mechanism because I think this one suffices. So you hydroxylate here only when oxygen levels are high. When you do, you recruit uh, a ubiquitin ligase, a class of enzymes that attaches chains of ubiquitin onto a target it's attached to, and you polyubiquitinate the protein. That polyubiquitin is a target for destruction. Oxygen levels fall, no hydroxyl groups, no hydroxyl, no recruitment of VHL, no polyubiquitination, and the HIF alpha levels rise sufficiently to enter into the nucleus, find R, and go control the expression of literally hundreds of genes. So what does the cell start for oxygen need? Well, of course, it needs more oxygen. So it turns on, for example, the hormone erythropoietin tells your body, make more red blood cells so you can increase the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. Uh, produce a variety of angiogenic factors directing the growth of new blood vessels into the hypoxic area. And meanwhile, while all these changes are occurring, engineer the metabolism of the cell that functions chiefly under glycolysis, allowing the efficient production, albeit not at high levels, of ATP even when O2 levels are low. That's great when it happens only intermittently, but when it is turned on constitutively, usually because of defects up here, you're turning on a variety, the expression of a variety of different protein factors that are highly correlated with cancer onset and progression. So this is a serious problem. It impacts, it's a disease actually called von hippel lindau syndrome. In the United States it affects about 10,000 people about 2,000 in the UK. I don't have worldwide statistics, so I apologize, but it's a severe disease for families who have this to the point that parents of children who know that they are carrying this disease start going in for annual checks to their kids for cancer development in the early teens. And annually, 
you have to go in and get checked. And you know that you're hitting about a 70% chance, 70% chance of developing cancer in your life. And there have not been good therapeutic approaches to be able to go look at this. So as a result, my group joined up with a fantastic friend and collaborator for many years, Rick Bruick, to try tackling this, focusing on the plastamines that were being used here, remembering what did we see before out of the plants? We saw there that one of those log domains, which is a pastamine, it's just like controlled, could either be binding some other part of a protein or releasing it simply by a trivial change to chemistry inside of it. Maybe there might be some hope for that here amongst some of the pastamines in the hif orange system. That is challenging a lot of the traditional dogma in the pharmaceutical and in biotech industries. And for good reason, protein-protein interactions like this are traditionally challenging to target because the large interfaces used between proteins mean large compounds, which have been traditionally hard to get into cells. And this is not only an intracellular target, it's nuclear. Uh, finally, we had no structural information we started. Challenging, again, another class of ways that people routinely try targeting these things from structures. We had none of that. Uh, options for targeting involved some other ideas, including some really nice seminal work by Peter Ray and Gene Dyson, looking at the transcriptional activation main of the HIFs. Uh, but uh, those were quite complicated by some things that are really interesting biophysically. Those transcriptional activation domains are disordered, but that challenges targeting them with small molecules. So we want to go after the past domains, hoping that those in the HIFs could somehow or another be sensing things as we had seen over in the plant system. With that, we used traditional animal approaches, literally starting from DNA, having a very poor idea as to what a pastoming was there even then. And we could go through and rapidly using NMR spectroscopy, make different variations of the pastomains of the HIFs, smaller, longer. We assay them using traditional two-dimensional nitrogen proton uh, chemical shift analyses, even on things that weren't well purified. And that got us to idealized constructs that a postdoc of mine, Paul Erbel, and a student of mine, Paul Card, went to work on to go solve their structures using standard two-dimensional and three-dimensional NMR solution methods, giving us high-resolution structures about the, the C-terminal past B domain as binding partner on, on, on past B. And we could even build something showing that those two weakly interact in a test tube, AD of about 30 micromolar, Hopefully, no bound cofactors or internal cavities seen in these structures as we've had them here. Okay, now we know we've got a protein protein interaction. Let's go try finding a small molecule for it. Here, this is challenging. Over in the plant system, it's pretty easy. You make a piece of one of these proteins over in bacteria, and the protein there can grab a small molecule out of bacteria, can grab the flavin mononucleotide, and bring it with it as you purify it. And conveniently, it's bright yellow. Uh, it's a lot of fun watching a new student come in the lab and purify the protein. And they can simply watch where their protein is on a, on a chromatography experiment by looking for a following yellow protein. Uh, we get a lot more sophisticated than that, believe me, but it's always fun to see that story. No such luck here. So we needed ways to be able to go find small molecules. So we used NMR spectroscopy. We're working at the top end of an NMR kit fitted with a 600 position sample changing robot. We built a library of 800 chemical compounds built by a uh, postdoc in the lab at the time, Carlos and Mesper. And we have small molecules that look like they might bind to other things based on work by other groups, uh, both academic groups and industrial groups, talking about the kinds of chemical structures seen in known drugs. And uh, we screened it up against various pastamines, showing, for example, here as we go across from one residue one to about 800 here. I'll put a tick mark up any time we had a hit. We screen two targets initially for the first 550 compounds. We go buy another 250. Biased by what we saw hit before, we, we learn from that. We get even more efficient at finding hits there. We screen that same 800 compound library up against other past domains, other proteins that are known by small molecule ligands. We find different things that bind them. So these are what are known as small molecule fragments. Molecule weighed about 200. A typical drug used by the pharmaceutical industry is running at about 500. The larger the drugs in typical, the better they bind, more tightly and more specifically to the targets. Uh, these aren't intended to be drugs, but 
stretch the imagination. Uh, they are asking, can this protein bind anything? If so, how tightly and where? And we had a, a fantastic run at this. Tom Sherman came into the lab as a postdoc from the screen. They did this over on HIF2 alpha, found on the screen those 800 compounds using, again, two dimensional nitrogen proton and more experiments. We found things that bound great affinities on the order of low micromolar, which means intermediate affinity binding. We could work with two medicinal chemists to either purchase or make about 80 variations of our best hits. We got about tenfold better. And these shifts that we're picking up here, what residues are being more or less perturbed, are clues to us as to where the compound are binding inside of, in this case, the HIF2 alpha pass B domain. So from about a week of screening, we knew out of this 800 compound library, what bound, how tightly, and where inside of the target. And that's where we had an aha moment. A good reminder to get really good people in your group who are open to trying different methods. In this case, we had an aha moment by the addition of Jason Key, a postdoc with an X-ray crystallography background, who took some of the protein that we had, that again, we have an NMR structure of, and he crystallized it and showed that in a crystal, there's a slight variation of the interior of the protein in the way that we end up determining the structure. That ends up now revealing a large cavity inside of the protein of about 290 cubic angstroms. Um, for those of you who don't think in cubic angstroms, and believe me, I was one of those people until we, st until we started working in this area, 290 cubic angstroms is about large enough to hold a tryptophan and a glycine. So two molecules of myelological importance. Notably in Tom and Jason structures, that's full of water. If I have anyone in the room who's been through introductory biochemistry, usually have some problems with these two. Uh, number one, most proteins tend to build themselves around a hydrophobic cavity, or a hydrophobic core, excuse me, not a cavity leaving space in the middle of a protein, definitely not a cavity full of water. These cavities occur rarely out of the over 100,000 protein structures we already have. Where they do, they are highly indicative of the location of binding sites for small molecules inside of the protein that haven't yet been identified. And we can see various interactions here that set up water in here, but we think the water is there as a placeholder waiting for some small molecule to come. That's even better to control HIF function. A secondary piece of data that supported our hypothesis was by getting my two groups of two groups in the lab to talk to each other and sit down at a group meeting where the Tom and Jason said, hey, look at this cool cavity we had in the moment of protein and the plant people said, whoa, 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 whoa. That's exactly where the flavin homophore binds inside of all of our beautiful photosensors. Yeah, and again, I'll remind you, we can control protein-protein interaction here simply by making a bond and reducing a homophore. Imagine if we could go from just water over to something that looks like a drug, that we could do way better than that. And way better we did. So inspired by the NMR data, we then, again, together with Rick's lab, engaged in a conventional biochemical in vitro high throughput screen, now working with not an 800 compound library of small things, but a 200,000 compound library of compounds that look much more drug-like. And we had a biochemical assay called alpha screen. It's commercially available. Suffice to say that when two proteins interact in an alpha screen, you'll get a photon emitted, a yellow photon emitted when you illuminate with red light. When the two proteins are far apart, you say because a small molecule has disrupted them, the photon goes away. And that is a straightforward way to take about a month with a well-purified or well-behaving assay in a lot of robotics to go through and identify small molecules that bound even more potent. Again, animal played a critical role here as a so-called secondary screen. All alpha tells you is whether the yellow photon signal has gone away or not. There are some interesting ways for that to happen and some not interesting ways for that to happen. Animal can quickly tell you, again, let's take the individual pieces of a, those interactions, which side does it bind, how tightly, and where. And we put that together with other biophysical components to go look at this. So these compounds evolved from the initial things on the fragment screen here, uh, affinities and uh, potencies shown here, low micromolar of the fragment screen, 
improved by the larger number of more complex compounds of the alpha screen, including some compounds that I would assert remind us of some of the things we've learned from the fragment screen, and some are completely different. That helps inspire us as to how to make these even better. And then with that, Rick Gork and I participated in the formation of a small molecule cancer company called Peloton Therapeutics, whose objective it was, was to take discoveries like ours under the medical center and go move them into the kinds of assays that are different, in the, at least in the US model, perform in an academic center, especially trying to go through and improve the characteristics of these compounds for use in animal and human systems, and then actually beginning the kinds of clinical trials that are essential to prove that this idea can work in practice. Now, the, with help of seasoned medicinal chemists who have been through drug discovery and improvement before, our has improved only mildly compared to what you'd seen previously, but the compounds were far better suited for use in vitro and in vivo, including in human clinical trials. Notably, Peloton advanced two compounds, PT2385 and PT2977, into such clinical trials. In 2019, Peloton was acquired by Merck Pharmaceuticals um, to take advantage of its IP and unique position in this area amongst others. The lower of these two compounds became a Merck compound. And then with emergency approval in the United States by the Food and Drug Administration in the UK, my uh, counterpart, that is now known generically as Belzidafan or in commercial form as Wellareg because it has shown potent efficacy in treating various forms of kidney cancers that are caused by that von Hippel-Lindau disease and misregulation of HIF. I just wanna show two pieces of data from this, from phase two clinical trial of the second of those compounds I showed you. Just show you how amazing the data were from my perspective as someone who'd spent years trying to get this system together. In this case, uh, 61 patients were enrolled in a phase two clinical trial, all these people had von hippel lindau disease. So they are misregulated in HIF2 alpha, making it constitutively. Uh, they received all one 120 milligram dose of belzidafan daily and were on the trial for almost two years, 21 months. They had tumors of the kidney and had on average been through four surgeries. The traditional treatment for these tumors, again, this is a genetically inherited disease. You cannot go in and treat the root cause, only the symptoms of it. The traditional approach has been a couple of kinds of chemotherapeutics. Really, surgery has been the primary approach. They'd already been through four of those in their lives. Um, everyone tolerated the treatment well. There was an anticipated side effect of anemia. If controls the level of red blood cells you have in your blood, it was easily addressed by providing blood transfusions to those individuals while on trial. Data number one. 61 patients, let's take a look at what happened to their tumors, going from the beginning of the study to the end. Zero is if the tumor is still the same size, positive would be if their tumors grew, negative is if their tumors shrank. Stunningly, no one's tumors grew during this trial for the 61 patient cohort. A number of women responding showed here in blue, but even some of the so-called non-responders are stable disease, a third, up to a 30% reduction in tumor burden. Others showed even greater efficacy. And let's return to those surgeries. Again, that's the common clinical treatment for von hippel lindau disease and its manifestation in, in uh, clear cell renal cell carcinomas or cancers of the kidney. What I'm showing here is a plot going back in time up to 10 years prior to the start of the trial. Each line represents a patient. Every purple dot you see is someone going in and having a portion of the kidney removed to try reducing the cancers loaded on the kidney. Note many purple dots to the left at the start of the trial. After the start of the trial, the grand total of three or four events amongst all 61, providing very clearly and directly an improvement in uh, their life. So let's summarize this work. We started off with a protein structure with a big bag of water in the middle, breaking a lot of the rules of biochemistry, but telling us there might be something interesting about that site. We went and looked, starting initially with simple to more complex libraries in an academic setting, founded a company, and extended that work over into a jump from what had been up to studies in mice in the, on the academic side over to human clinical trials. That culminated in compounds that look similar to this. This is uh, one of Peloton's drugs found inside the target. 
uh, showing where the original cavity is being broken through and being reshaped by binding into the small molecule inside of it. Also, the fan, as I mentioned before, has now been approved for clinical use in the United States and the United Kingdom for people with von Hippel-Lindau disease. That's approximately 12,000 individuals. It's currently in phase two and three clinical trials on its own and in combinations with other advanced chemotherapeutics to see if we can make a dent, not just in von Hippel-Lindau disease, but in renal cancer. Almost half a million people are diagnosed with renal cancer worldwide every year. Now, while I do not anticipate by any stretch of the imagination that melzodifan or these combinations will be anywhere near as effective on a percentage basis as with VHL. VHL, we know the root cause, if 2 alpha is out of control, therefore inhibiting it should show great effect. But even if a 5% of this number shows any sign of response, it is a potent weapon, in our opinion, of a targeted class of therapies that could be very effective. So, um, and again, thousands of people are enrolled in clinical trials in the US to answer those questions, but look forward to seeing where that goes. Um, I'm going to just simply note that I, I'm gonna skip the third part of the, the story for reasons of time, but I wanna note that literally thousands of additional proteins contain past domains. A few are in human systems, maybe providing insights into novel ways to control a variety of other cancers, or as I would have very much appreciated in jumping from New York to India a couple of weeks ago, including the circadian clock. It would be nice to be able to take a magic pill and have it reset instantly. Um, but many more are the bacterial, fungal, and plant systems. And I do not think these can or should be ignored. I think these set up a wonderful foundation of novel classes of sensors that can be widely used in science and engineering beyond. Uh, and very exciting prospects about that. And we think we have novel ways to be able to address that. So conclusions, NMR is an essential discovery tool. We want NMR spectrometers, which represent substantial investments by our universities, our state and federal governments and other funders to support the kinds of work like you see here. We wanna be able to have those impact not just basic science, but also have some of those turn into things like what we had with Elzotifan and turn into impact on human health very directly. I cannot underscore strongly enough that NMR was essential for the raw dumbing work. All the photosensing you saw initially was turned into tools for biotech. And over into Belzotifan, the HIPS 2 story, everywhere from telling us what we should be working on, what parts of protein are useful for study and well-behaved, all the way to going through and providing screens to tell us what might be binding and where and helping guide chemists to make them even better. This was by far and away the most flexible and versatile biochemical or biophysical tool in our arsenal to be able to do this. Uh, and work I didn't have time to tell you about, I, I think combining some of this with high pressure NMR will give us new ways to be able to go find additional domains with novel pockets or cavities, more on that uh, the next time we get together. But um, I really cannot underscore strongly enough. This has been such a privilege to be able to be part of with the team of people and approaches we've had and to watch the idea go from a very basic science idea in a couple of different formats all the way over to applications in a variety of different ways. And it's been a real pleasure getting a chance to be able to share that with some of you today. I'll close with, uh, again, thanking my group and our funders. This is a great summary slide of the kind of work that I presented today. Thanks very much for your attention. I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, really fascinating talk. And it's almost, uh, um, it's remarkable that the uh, phenomenon biochemistry research leading to a uh, therapeutic that can save lives. So, okay, the floor is open for questions. So while other people are thinking, I will ask you one. So this, uh, this earlier part of work in the light oxygen voltage sensors, the LOV sensors. Yes. Uh, where you showed the NMR spectra and you uh, shown light uh, laser mm -hmm. on the protein, with the, on the sensor while it's inside the NMR Correct. magnet. And uh, the time scale were within seconds when the spectra were changing. Correct. So how did you, was it the series of HSQC experiments? Uh, 
Yeah, so this is great for the non-NMR experts in the room. Uh, bear with us for about 15 seconds because it's uh, a neat sleight of hand that we use to acquire this. NMR, uh, multi-dimensional NMR, like you heard here today, is based off of a series of one-dimensional spectra where a certain variable, a certain time in an indirect dimension is incremented between each of the ways to go do this. Conventionally, those would be done, as the question always do, in such a way that you would record an entire two-dimensional data set, then move on to record the next two-dimensional data set, the next. Each of those two-dimensional data sets, even if we get as aggressive as possible a speed, requires minutes, not seconds to acquire. The way that we have circumvented that in this case, because you have sharp eye, the time scale there is in single digits, is to recognize that we can repeatedly pump the system from the dark to the light, to the dark to light again and again. And what that let us do is instead of acquiring, think of my movie, if you will, as a hundred frames, a hundred two-dimensional spectra that you would want to acquire, the traditional way to acquire them would be to acquire frame one, frame two, frame three, frame four. We have chosen here to record them in a different way record the first one-dimensional spectrum of frame one, two, three, up to 100, repeat that way. Uh, it was some of the most fun NMR data processing I've ever done, completed in what's part of a Macintosh laptop on a UK to US flight. I love the increased power of computing. And I look forward to hopefully having equally important problems to crunch on, on the Chennai to London to New York flight tomorrow. <laughs> it's even longer. I have that much more time to work. <laughs> Great question. Other questions? Please. Information you hope to get with high pressure in them. Great question. So with high pressure, and when I talk about high pressure here, let's count. So as I've discussed with several of you, one thing I've enjoyed about coming to India is to be a student. I enjoy being a professor and teaching, but once in a while I enjoy changing hats. And in this case, part of what I came to India to learn was to develop some additional skills over in diving relatively deep as a recreational scuba diver, which I did in Pondicherry. There, uh, you gain one atmosphere and pressure every 10 meters you are under the water. So yesterday I was at an all-time low for me of 37 meters. So there I'm operating at approximately 4.7 atmospheres of pressure. Here, I don't want to go to 4.7 atmospheres. I want to go to 2,000 or 2,500 atmospheres. Indeed, you can use high pressure at levels like this to literally cook foods. You will take many proteins through an irreversible unfolding denaturation, which is not at all separate from what you see with heat. So why would we want to do any of that? Uh, there are, of course, organisms that live at the bottom of the trench, about 1,200 atmospheres. There are actually microorganisms that live in the Earth's crust at pressures even far higher than that. Why do we want to do this in the lab? It's the bag of water. That inspired us. Most proteins are built out of, built, evolved to have a hydrophobic core, which as you compress it, it compresses uniformly across the protein as a whole. Effects such as these cavities have very different pressure responses. And what we wanted to do, uh, yeah, uh, what we wanted to do is have an alternative, the, the conventional way to go find such cavities. In 2022, uh, there are some interesting computational methods that can reveal some of them. But I think the traditional power and intermediate gold standard is uh, X-ray crystal. I've solved a high-resolution crystal structure and identified that there are unique waters inside of the system. A good day, I'll take a week or two to do. Sometimes I'll take years because the crystallization process is highly idiosyncratic. I want faster than that. I want an answer tonight. And I want it done not just by people who have had years of experience doing NMR. I want to teach a computer how to do this. Or again, back to our educational mission, I want undergrads to be able to come into the lab and go discover something without requiring a year or two worth of background before they can. 
So we took advantage of that. Um, taking a look at the effects of high pressure on protein NMR spectra and simply asking, does the system respond uniformly? If so, it's probably not got a significant cavity inside of it. Or does it respond with some signals behaving very differently than the others? And actually, if we want to make the analysis as fast as possible, I don't really care what parts of the protein are telling me that the signals are different. Just I want to take a pull, like I walk into a room and have my eyes closed and, okay, class, and today we're going to learn about A and B and just listen, who's, who's louder? If everyone responds A or B, okay, we got an answer, but if not, even just a few B voices when the rest are saying, hey, hey, all right, there's something going on here. That can happen overnight and is trivial for us to do the analysis. And we've gone through and checked now this in about 50 proteins and protein complexes. And wow, I'm getting excited about it because what can happen is in cases like HIV2 alpha, if it's just a big bag of water, we see that A and B vote happening. We see the, the, uh, you know, the, the idiosyncratic response or diversity of responses across the, the protein. You supply a compound like one of Peloton's drugs or one of its predecessors, all goes away. We can show a protein where we think we have different Bones binding to different parts of the protein. Maybe some go into a cavity and some don't. One of those projects, we got the answer to that after about 15 years of looking. We could have had the data in overnight. We found out by this. It wouldn't have told us where it bound, but we would have known the two prospective drugs were binding through very different mechanisms into very different ways. So that's what we're doing with high pressure. I mean, I, I do feel kind of embarrassed. I'm mean, standing here as the son of a PhD physical chemist. And Physical chemists are taught that they have a couple of important variables to control systems universally. Temperature is the big one, right? We all know temperature will control systems really nicely. The one we conveniently ignore more often than not, pressure. It's complicated to get at experimentally, but there are nice high pressure pumps. There are nice uh, high pressure uh, NMO tubes that are uh, able to withstand these tremendous pressures we're putting on them. And it's been a fantastic line of work uh, that I've really enjoyed to complement what you heard here today. Thank you. Good question. Okay, if there are no more questions, and let's thank Professor Werner again for this wonderful talk. Thank you.